All right, what's up, family? This conference feels like being with friends and family. Some of you guys I've uh, met over the years at various conferences. Who remembers Free Your Mind? Woo! Yeah, we got any Free Your Mind veterans here? Cool, so this gives me the, that nice family Free Your Mind type vibe. Uh, but I'm gonna introduce myself briefly. I do apologize if some of my speech today is a little bit all over the place. Uh, it's, it's on purpose. Um, but so, for those who don't know, my name is Derek Bros. I'm a journalist, activist. I have a website and YouTube channel called the Conscious Resistance Network. Uh, I've been doing this for the last decade, based in Houston. Uh, I have a radio show in Houston, and a lot of my work is based in Houston, uh, not just through YouTube. Uh, and up until, I guess, seven months ago, I've been pretty involved and committed to these various movements, truther movements, conspiracy movement, uh, anarchist movement. But I decided to spend the last seven months kind of getting out of that bubble, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, or at least my experiences with that and what I've been up to, and maybe some ideas on how we can continue to reach out to meet new people and keep growing these ideas so that we're not just preaching to the choir at events like this, as great as they are. We all know we're preaching to the choir here for the most part. Maybe we're, li we're uncovering some new details to the puzzle that we hadn't heard before, but generally, nobody's walking in this door who's not already, you know, pursuing this knowledge. You know, unless you brought in a friend who's totally like, what the fuck are these people on? <laughs> Some of you might be thinking that, it's all right. Um, but yeah, so I've been spending the last 10 years since 2000, really 2009 is when I started to wake up in Houston, getting into activism, getting into journalism, and then speaking at these conferences since 2013, places like Anarchapoco, speaking in anarchist events, speaking in transformational events, more kind of spiritual events, trying to bring the anarchist message to them, trying to bring the spiritual message to this community. My website, again, is The Conscious Resistance. It's also the name of a book trilogy that I've written, co-authored with my friend John Vibes. And it's, I guess you could say, the philosophy or the, the kind of movement that we were pushing and continue to push. Essentially, The Conscious Resistance just means the moment that you realize, that the recognition, the understanding, the awareness that the fight for a more free, ethical, and just world isn't going to come from just fighting the institutions of the state or taking down the corporations. Much like Carrie Wedler was saying earlier. Anybody hear Carrie's talk? It was pretty good. Yeah? <laughs> so, like she was talking about, there's other avenues that, you know, not all our problems can just be blamed on the government, can be blamed on the state. A lot of it is our own fucked up shit, our own trauma, our own things that we refuse to face. And I realized this early on in my work because prior to waking up to politics, watching Alex Jones' Endgame, reading Jim Mars' um, Rule by Secrecy, reading Ron Paul's Revolution, all those things happened to me within a span of a week and nothing was ever the same. Before that happened, I had my more kind of internal, spiritual, kind of starting the healing process awakening because in 2005, almost 15 years ago, I was locked up. I got addicted to crystal meth when I was 20 years old went to prison and started meditating and really just had to go inward. I've been around drugs and alcohol and prison my entire life. My earliest memories are going to visit my birth father in prison and um, just been in and around that on both sides of my family. My father actually died of a drug overdose last summer while I was doing touring the US. So it's something that's been very prevalent. When I found myself going down that same path, getting locked up, it really did force me to start thinking about what the hell I've been doing. How did I get in this position? You know, what, you know, just everything that I went through from ending up living on the streets and being around all these just crazy scenarios that sooner or later will turn into one of my books. But I went through those experiences, got locked up and realized this is not the path I want to go on. And two of the things that saved my life in there, journaling every single day, writing down my thoughts, starting to uncover and peel back those layers that I've been so afraid of, uh, understanding, getting to know myself, and seeing where my trauma was coming from and why I was using drugs as an escape. Now, I believe in freedom, of course, and I don't think people should be locked in cages for the things they put in their bodies, including crystal meth, as nasty as it is. I don't think that helps anybody. I needed help because I was super depressed and suicidal and I was using drugs as an escape. Throwing me in a cage didn't do it, didn't fix me. I chose to you know, go inwards and, and to try to start healing that. So journaling every day, just starting to get, write my thoughts down and go through these things. And it was interesting, as I was locked up, I noticed even my handwriting started to become more precise and more slow, like because I was just kind of detaching. Once I accepted, like I looked at the calendar, I'm not going anywhere for at least a year. You gotta let go of that outside world and that's a very difficult feeling because you don't want to let go of the, the free world as we call it in there. You don't want to let go of it. You want to think about it and call your friends and call your girlfriend every day, but all that does is make every moment go by so slow. So you have to let go. And you have to totally give in to that powerlessness that there's not a single person, mom, 
girlfriend, friend, lawyer who can get you out of that position, and you're there. So what are you going to do with it? Well, you can get educated on other crimes if you like. That's, uh, that option's always there. Uh, you can waste away. You can work out a lot. I chose to get to know myself better, and journaling helped me do that every day, just getting to know myself in that way. Then one day I read uh, the newspaper, and on the Saturday section of the Houston Chronicle, they have a religion section where they quote from the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, and occasionally they quote from the Buddhist Bible, the Dhammapada. And there was a verse from the Buddha that I don't remember, but it was something that struck me just so deeply that I immediately needed to learn everything I could about Buddhism and started to dig into that, and then more specifically Zen Buddhism, and then more specifically Zazen sitting meditation. So I had my grandmother send me books and just went down this whole rabbit hole. So those things happened to me in 2005, between 2005 and 2008. I got out of prison for the final time the month before Obama got elected, which is a really interesting time to be re-emerging into the world. People are like, this guy's either going to save the world or he's the Antichrist. I didn't really know much about anything that at that point. And uh, I got out and I had the experience of being a, being a felon and being judged in that whole new way. And while I was at a library applying for jobs, I read a book called Cannabis A History that exposed me to the realities of the drug war and the origins of the drug war, racism, money, um, government, <laughs> you know, what else? And that was a really just, it was the first book I ever voluntarily took notes on because I was so enthralled by it. I was like, wow, why wasn't I taught this in high school? I was in advanced history classes and I didn't learn about this. They didn't teach me this version. And that was the beginning of what else didn't I, you know, did I not learn? And as I said, went down those rabbit holes 10 years later and here we are. But the spiritual aspect of it, the kind of internal healing happened to me first. So when I started to wake up to the political side, the corporate side of corruption and the kind of physical battle that we deal here, I was already aware of the necessity of working on our trauma and our healing. And so that ultimately became what we call the conscious resistance. And more recently what I'm referring to as holistic activism or holistic anarchism. And I'll just be brief on this. Usually, you know, I focus a lot on these topics. Uh, to, this is not really going to be the focus of today, but I will give a brief background. You know, holistic and anarchism, I've noticed, are two of these words that are probably the most overused and misused words out there and misunderstood. You see, when it comes to holistic, you see everything from holistic sex to holistic gardening to holistic cat food to holistic whatever. You name it, there's a holistic version of it. And anarchism, as we know, typically means violence in most people's minds. That's, or at least that's how the media uses it. So holistic truly means to study whole systems as opposed to breaking them down into individual pieces and, and different uh, s fields of study and different modalities that affects the way you understand a subject. So whether it's holistic psychology, holistic ecology, the study of the entire plant, animals, humans, plants, all as one species, one system. Uh, holistic medicine in its truest sense is the study of the whole body, trying to treat the whole body, find the root cause rather than just treating the symptom, right? So that's what holistic means. And when you put that together with anarchism, which anarchism is just the simple and beautiful and wonderful idea that we each own ourselves and that we are the masters of our own lives, that we are smart enough, you are good enough, and you are powerful enough to own yourself and to decide what's best for you, and that we don't have to agree on everything. We can have healthy discussion and healthy debate, but that it's immoral, wrong, impractical uh, to force our way on other people, to use violence on other people. That's all anarchism is. So we put that together, holistic anarchism. What is a holistic anarchist? A holistic anarchist is one that, is, that does not only point their fingers outwards to these institutions and towards these people and these places. And, and you know, I've given presentations on the pyramid of power, what I call the pyramid of power, and I've identified you know, who I see and th uh, that makes up this system. And that's necessary and it's important. If we don't wake up to these things, you know, we can't start finding solutions, right? So you have to know what the problem is in order to start seeking the solution. But a holos holistic anarchist doesn't just stop there and say, okay, well, Monsanto is poisoning the world, so, you know, I'm going to go march all day and rage against Monsanto. The idea is to point those fingers back at yourself and s to say, how am I contributing to this problem? Well, you know what? I'm still buying from companies that are using Monsanto as products. I'm still spraying my lawn with Roundup or, you know, these kind of things. Well, you're a part of the problem then. Now, let's just be real. You are working against yourself and your own goals. And the l we each do this in different ways. This is not a thing of judgment. The whole idea, and I wrote a book all about this called The Holistic Self-Assessment. You can download it for free on my website about how to look at your entire life and to start to see where your life is out of alignment with your stated goals and principles. Are your everyday habits and practices in line with that? And you'll find areas where you're inconsistent because we all are, because it's very difficult to be a perfectly consistent pr principled person in this world. But the idea is that you start thinking holistically about all these areas of your life and not just talking about it on Facebook or not just focusing on one aspect. I think we have to take a full holistic approach. So 
That's what I call holistic uh, anarchism. And whether you're an anarchist or not, holistic activism, it still applies you know, across the board. We can each work to getting our, the pieces of our lives more in alignment with the beliefs that we hold, as opposed to just stating them and talking about them, but actually living. You know this whole idea that we actually be the change that we want to be, that thing that we all love to shout about? Actually doing it. So my work is focused on, on these topics for, for years now. And an, another aspect of that has been the philosophy of agorism and counter-economics, and I don't have time to get into those today, but I would ask anybody who hasn't heard that word, agorism, as in agora, as in the marketplace, like you see over here, agorism uh, and counter-economics. Those are two other big parts of what I believe, and it's essentially just the idea that instead of trying to vote our way out of this thing we're dealing with, instead of trying to violently overthrow them, it won't work. I mean, <laughs> we'd have to hurry. <laughs> Got a lot of little time left. But the idea that instead of taking them head on, instead of just participating only in the system and thinking that voting for a new president is going to fix things, we actively exit and opt out of the system and start pulling not only our moral support but our money, our time, our energy away from them, building this next stage of humanity. Not so that we can become the masters and the kings and queens of tomorrow, but so that we can create a better world and a better time where people can live free and know that they are the masters of themselves, that they do own themselves, and that they should, that they benefit, that we each benefit from respecting each other's self-ownership and respecting the, auto the autonomy of each of us as individual beautiful beings. So in order to create that world, Agorism and counter-economics is about creating new systems. We've talked a lot about crypto throughout this conference. Crypto is just one mechanism of counter-economics, and the man who wrote about it, he died in 2004. He never lived to see crypto happen, but he wrote about it, and he knew that these tools were going to happen and that we were going to have ways to start exiting the system. And so, and we're going to talk more about this in just a bit. We are at a brief window, I think, though, where the, we have tools like crypto and encryption and other things that are providing for showing us what a world in the hands of free people can look like, but we also have things like facial recognition technology, the 5G smart grid, the Internet of Things. Uh, you know, did anybody know in the next year, 2020, going into 2021, in order to fly domestically in the United States of America, you will have to submit to facial recognition technology? Everybody aware of that? That's where we're headed. That's where we're at. It's not some distant, far-off future. And these things, for me, are certain red lines that back in the day I said, if they ever do this, I'm getting the fuck out. I'm coming to those lines very soon. Because I, I don't see a lot of people taking action in the ways that I think would maybe keep me around. So a big part of ph the philosophy of agorism and counter-economics is, again, opting out of the system. So naturally, that lends itself to non-voting, to not participating in that system. I spent a lot of my work. You can look up my name in non-voting. You find lots of videos I've done on talking about the value of community action over voting in politics. And now I find myself in the unique position of running for mayor of Houston. <laughs> Now, the reason isn't because I've decided I want to be a career politician, I've given up on my anarchist values, or given up on any of the things I've written about and talked about for the last decade. The answer, the reason, I mean, it's, it's a multi-part answer, but one of them, I will say, is the lack of action that I see in the world, in my own community in Houston, in the anarchist movement, in the truther movement, in the crypto movement. I don't know how many of us are truly serious about being free. And I say that with all the respect in the world because I recognize that we all have different living situations. We all have different financial situations. The one thing that unites us here is that we want to come talk about crazy things and be around cool people for a weekend, right? We don't agree about all the details, but we're here to have a good time and explore ideas that we know out there are not necessarily welcomed. But beyond that, we all come from different backgrounds. We're going to go home to different places, different experiences. And so I, r I understand that. But when I talk about agorism and I talk on about non-voting, the idea is not not vote and then do nothing. The idea is that the only way we can actively create change is we have to pull our support from that system and simultaneously build new systems and support new systems to exit from that state. And I do believe this is a generational change, as Samuel Konkin talked about, seeing this happen in stages. So I'm not giving up on thinking that it's going to happen. The change I fight for, I honestly don't know if I will even ever live to, live to see at the, the rate the state is growing. But I think it's damn sure worth trying and doing something. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I honestly don't see too, too many people who are actually serious about that. And again, we all come from different backgrounds, right? I know that we're all not necessarily aiming at the same goal. For me, what I've found is the only way I feel like I can be free in this world, because there are some days where it's literally this 
this fucking crushing feeling that I have to live in this world, that we're being lied to on such a mass scale and that people cannot see it and that people like Ross are locked up and that people are just getting fucked over in the States. I mean, it just, it's sometimes it's, it's so much and I just don't even want to be here. And so I have to find some way to, you know, of course, it goes back to the message of the conscious resistance, finding that peace inside as well, right? And obviously that's a part of it. But we can't very well find our inner peace if every day the physical world is crushing down on us. And it's becoming increasingly invasive as time goes on. Um, I do think we need to hold on to that heart center as we take these physical manifestations on. But it's a lot to take on and to realize that the situation we're in. And I'm just not content with personally finding a house in the city or a house in the suburbs and knowing these things, but just going on and being dependent on the grocery store and being dependent on these big companies and just like living my life like a fucking consumer, like that's a mindless zombie. But okay, well, I know what's going on. That's not enough. I need to live as close to my values as possible. And for me, as I've talked about for the last few years, that in 2020, my plan has been to launch an intentional community to build this, to create. And I've, and I've spent the last couple of years traveling more and been down to Costa Rica and seen successful communities that are using ideas like permaculture and decentralized values. They might not call themselves anarchists, but they're living this life already. And they're 95% off the grid. They've got internet. They've got power, but it's all solar. They're growing all their own food. They're using permaculture. And they're living in a fucking paradise. And I'm like, dude. Why am I not doing this already? This is possible. I don't know if it's possible inside the border of the United States. I don't know if we'll find that freedom there. I'm not saying we give up and leave, but what I'm building for in the future is what I call the counter-economic underground railroad. I think that there realistically might come a time and a place where it won't be safe or, you know, if, if as we're gonna get into in a moment, as this, and as we've heard throughout this talk, uh, this, this event, the social credit score is coming to the United States, and it's already here in soft ways. We already have different mechanisms which effectively serve that same purpose. But I do think that what we see in China will happen here where Americans are denied eventually because you said the wrong thing on Facebook or because you have antisocial behavior or you attended a rally when you were 15 and now your social credit score is down. And your buddies say, I'm sorry, man, I can't come see you this weekend because, dude, this, you're going to bring my score down. I'm sorry. Like, and before we know it, we become further and further isolated. We lose all those privileges. I think this is a realistic thing. It's not, uh, I'd say, too far off. And that does worry me. And part of that is the 5G smart grid, the Internet of Things. Like all these, again, the balance of technology, the beautiful side. Can crypto adopt adoption happen quick enough before this other side is going up and, and created? So I think these are things we need to worry about. And in that situation, I started to think, how do we opt out? How do we create new systems? if they're scanning your face everywhere you go? How do you, you know, work under the table if everything has become digitized and then there's the, you know, Fedcoin or Libra or whatever they end up using, right? And that's the only allowable currency. What are people willing to do? And this is actually part of a new book that I'm writing that'll be coming out in December. It's called Counter Economics, How to Opt Out of the Technocratic State. And, you know, the whole idea, what I've been realizing is there's some formula that I'm trying to put my finger on that essentially is a way for us to understand what for one, what does freedom mean to you as an individual? What does that look like? For me, like I said, it's land, it's growing most, if not all of my own food, being in a community of people, teaching these ideas, doing workshops, documenting the whole process, showing people this shit's possible. That's what it looks like for me. So figure out what it means to you, and then ask yourself, how much are you willing to do to get that? What is your level of sacrifice versus, you know, you want this goal, but what are you willing to do to get it? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to give up things? Are you willing to rearrange your life? And that answer is all up to you, and it's not for me or anyone else to judge. But I do think that's where the answer lies. Some of us are comfortable just talking about these things on YouTube. We're not realizing that. The things that we're talking and watching every day on YouTube, it's more than just conspiratainment, infotainment. It's a reality. A reality that if we do nothing about, it's only going to get worse. So again, I decided to run for mayor of Houston because despite believing in agorism, yeah, it's interesting how people applaud me that I'm running for mayor and they didn't do anything before. It's like, I think the things I was doing before are still the answer. In fact, I decided to, I decided to infect their system for six months. I got 50 days left. And look, it, let me just tell you this, and I advise everybody not to necessarily to run for office, but find simple ways to hijack their system like this. Derek Bros, the activist, the journalist, the YouTuber has been in Houston for a decade, been very active. I've been covered by, some of my work's been covered on local news and things like that, but for the most part, I'm just the crazy local conspiracy theorist is you know how they have referred to me at certain times 
Um, but I have, you know, I've done, I've done a lot of work. But all of a sudden, you put this title next to my name, candidate for mayor. Last week, I spoke at a high school. The week before that, I spoke at a retirement community. I'm getting invited to Democratic forums, Republican forums, Latino forums, black forums. I'm speaking in the poor neighborhoods, the, the rich neighborhoods. They're all reaching out because now I'm a part of this, this show, this shit show, right? There's, t there's 12 people who are running, myself among them. But of course, the media tells everybody, here are the five candidates running for office. I've had eight different forums try to keep me out because, oh, they, have, they create whatever bullshit criteria they can to keep only those five candidates in there. Oh, well, you haven't formally served in office and you haven't raised $100,000, so you know, you're not a part of our group. Well, what do I do? I just post it publicly. Hey, everybody, here's another group who says that you don't deserve to hear what's going on. And let me tell you, people are fucking listening. People are listening in Houston. I'm hijacking the signal of the fourth largest city in the country for six months. <laughs> People keep asking me, well, what are you going to do if you win? I'm going to freak the fuck out. <laughs> and then I'm going to call every one of you brilliant people that I know and say, get to Houston. We're about to change this city. Now, I don't think it's a realistic possibility, but that's what I would do. Uh, you know, again, I mean, we're, we're getting local media coverage. We're getting invited, all these things. I'm running on a platform, you know, in Houston local politics, there's no parties. So that's another reason. I wouldn't have done it any other ways if I had to say, like, all right, I'm with this party, that party. So there's no party affiliation. It's obvious which of these establishment politicians are with the Democrats. The current mayor was endorsed by Obama in 2015. The other guy running donated $750,000 to Trump. You know, he's, it's pretty clear who, where they stand, right? So... I get, though, after, for the last year, I think some of you guys have seen my YouTube videos on 5G, going to city council and talking shit to these people and educating them and trying to wake people up. Yeah, thank you guys for sharing that. For one reason or another, that first video I did last October has over, over like 900,000 views, just me yelling at city council members. But, um, but so I've been doing that, right? And then I've been doing the journalistic thing. Okay, the mayor's going to be at this event. I'm going to go there and put a camera in his face and ask him the questions. I've interviewed the CEO of Verizon. I've interviewed the mayor of Houston. I've interviewed Dr. Martin Paul of Washington State University on the health concerns. I've interviewed uh, attorneys with the ACLU of Northern California about the privacy concerns. I've been doing my fucking homework on this, and I've been putting it in their face and making them talk about it. But they run away from me. They try to knock my camera down. They tell me my time's up at city council. I got sick of it, and it started out as a joke. You know, this mayor really thinks he's something. Somebody should run for the nobodies. And then from that joke, Derek bros for mayor. <laughs> and so I decided, though, if I'm going to do this, it's not going to be a joke campaign. It's not going to be vermin supreme with a boot on my head. It's going to be that I'm going to take it serious enough that I'm going to run it. When people come talk to me and ask me questions, I actually have something to say. And, of course, for me, I try to do it in the least status way possible. Everything I'm talking about from ending the drug war is just getting the government out of the way. Ending the drug war, saying that I would stand against mandatory vaccinations. And it's funny, that one really throws people off. But I just tell them I'm just being principled and consistent all the way across the board. I do believe you own yourself, your body, your choice, right? Bodily autonomy. So you should be able to smoke weed if you want. And you should be able to decide what goes in your body. And government shouldn't have that right. And again, people are listening. People are listening. They, don't, they didn't know they cared about self-ownership. I never would have been, been able to speak at the... Uh, what is it called? Shady Acres or one of these kind of names, <laughs> like some retirement community where they, these nice older folks told me that they, their average age is 84 and they have some people who are 104 and they have some of those young folks in their late 60s there too. And this is just this huge retirement community. They got their own bank. They got their own you know, pharmacy there. 200 of them, and I'm talking to them about decriminalizing cannabis and why they own themselves and why 5G, you know, they should be concerned about it. Again, I was never invited to speak to any of these people. Last week, I'm speaking to a high school, which honestly, I went as sort of a report because these kids are definitely heavily indoctrinated. They're definitely smart. This particular school I went to is called the Student Climate Caucus. And as they pointed to all the adults in the room and said, yes, you will have to get raise in taxes. Yes, you will pay a lot more taxes, but it's because if we do nothing, the world's going to end in 12 years. And this is what these kids are out there saying. So they invited the candidates to come speak to them for five minutes. I was like, holy crap, I get to speak to some junior high and high school kids for five minutes? Fuck yeah, I'm doing that. And I talked to them about decentralization. I talked to them about permaculture. And I asked them to respect the tradition of individual liberty when they start pursuing their solutions and to think about these ideas and also thank them because they were obviously intelligent. They obviously could learn and recite f uh, facts and, and think, but I don't think they'd quite been able to question the adults around them and their own intentions and their own purposes. Uh, so yeah, it was, it's just been an interesting experience. And I don't think this is the perfect answer for everybody. Honestly, I don't think everyone could do what I'm doing, namely because 
I have a history of being involved in Houston, so it's not like I'm just coming out of nowhere. People have seen me around being involved in the community in different ways. I have a record to point to of like, look, I've confronted this police officer, I've confronted this mayor, I've done this, I've been out here exposing this. And the other thing is now some of the other candidates are actually trying to steal my ideas, or you know, steal the ideas. They're just repeating the things. All of a sudden, they're all talking about corruption. All of a sudden, they're all saying, we, you know, at least one of the other candidates stole my idea of saying that one of the platforms I'm running on is that we should take away the power from the mayor because he's a dictator. And, and so I'm the only one saying that, or at least I was. Now there's another candidate saying we should talk about taking the power of the mayor away. So my win is not to become mayor on November 5th. My win is already happening. I'm getting to neighborhoods that I never was before in the last 10 years. I'm talking to normies. I'm going to be in two. When I go home from this, I have 14 events in 14 days. There's going to be two televised debates all, all across the city of Houston. And I'm going to be talking about the things you care about. I'm going to be talking about 5G. I'm going to be talking about uh, self-ownership. I'm going to be talking about why the government shouldn't mandate mandatory vaccinations. I'm going to be talking about ending the drug war and ending all these things. So again, I'm just hijacking their signal. Find ways to hijack the signal. Take some kind of action. Because as I said, this is kind of born out of my own frustration with seeing like, well, fuck. It, it's just happening too quick. I can't just sit here and keep talking on YouTube every day. That's not enough. Like, how can I you know, get, get more people involved. Because these people aren't the type of folks who are going to come to this conference, you know. They're not the kind of people who are necessarily even going to search for these topics on YouTube. They probably would never come across these ideas. So this is why I said at the panel yesterday for whoever was there, is anybody in this room too good to pass out a flyer? Because we've been doing as simple things, and it's like a political tactic, right? You go door to door, block walking. But why couldn't you have a flyer with, you know, information from Mark's work with a link to you know a video and just go to door to door because you care about that idea and you want your neighbors to know about it. If we don't talk to the people around us, they are going to continue to be indoctrinated. And when the shit hits the fan, you're going to be surrounded with a bunch of people who think the government is the answer and think people like you are crazy. And that's going to be a lot harder to deal with if we haven't made the efforts to establish connections with the people around us. And I myself am guilty of this. Like I said, I could have been hitting up all these neighborhoods before the campaign. I'm frustrated with myself that it took for me to do this to finally go make more of an effort. I feel like I was making some effort, put in some time, but why couldn't I hit that neighborhood up before? You know, why didn't I think about that? So it's been teaching me a lot. And like I said, this is a six-month experiment. This is not something you're ever going to see me do again. And people are listening. People are coming to us from the other campaigns and saying, we like what you're talking about. They don't want their guys to know, though. So I'm like, OK, well, come, come over with us. Talk about it. Help us spread these ideas. And I'm making it clear to people, don't put your hopes in me. Because when this is over, whether or not I won the election or not, if more people are talking about this, that means we help at least plant those seeds. I'm not saying they're going to be fully woke people and they're going to be understanding natural law and anarchism, but maybe they're on the beginning of their journey now of starting to question the systems around them. Because I'm showing them, look, the local media interviewed me and then they refused to put it on TV. Hey, this guy said that I can't come in his thing because I don't have $100,000. I'm exposing, and this is how the corruption happens. Everybody's worried about the federal government. It happens in your neighborhood group. It happens in your local civic organization. This is how they keep these people in a bubble. So when they invite them to, hey, come to your neighborhood for we're inviting all the mayoral candidates and there's only five people there those five people who are just more of the same bs that's how they keep people and that's just in the political world it works so many other ways but it's happening in your backyard it's not just the far away big things it's right in our backyards and that's where i think we need to focus more of our action and get established locally we can't rely on social media particularly because i sort of touched on the 5g smart grid the internet of things you know, I think you guys are probably very aware of some of the concerns. Again, it's a tool. I do think that there's all kinds of ways we could say, well, with 5G, healthcare is going to be this, and they're going to have these benefits. And those are all real. There's definitely benefits to these ideas. But the downsides are things that really scare the shit out of me. You know, I don't think it's like they're building in Houston. This is why I started getting focused. Houston was one of the first rollout cities of 5G. And the more I've learned about it, the more I've seen that it's just another government corporate power grab. You know, it, even if you don't buy the health concerns, if you care at all about like the little bit of freedoms we got, the FCC and the big wireless, the telecom lobby known as the CTIA, partnered with them to basically say that cities and states and municipalities and counties have no say in what this 5G rollout. You can't decide how much to charge it. You have to approve it within 90 days. The only thing you can argue is you think it's ugly and they'll turn it into a palm tree. You know, you can't argue it on health grounds. So it's, and in Texas, there's also a state law. And this is what's happening in a lot of places. You got the federal government, Trump partnering with them. I mean, the freaking thing's ran by a former Verizon lawyer. What else do you need to know? And then on the local level, the state level, and then down to the, no the local level where I'm at in Houston, you got like the current mayor. He's the 5G wireless champion. He was given an award for this by the, by the telecom lobby. You can't make this shit up. So it's happening from top to bottom. 
And so more, even if you don't buy the health concerns, you don't think 5G is going to be, you know, the mind control, whatever. I know people have all kinds of theories. At the very least, it's another usurpation of power from, you know, local level. And that's about all we got left is trying to fight things locally. So obviously this is not being reported anywhere. They're, you know, they're making any, but the New York Times said people who are concerned about 5G are buying into Russian propaganda. Those Russians, they want us to be worried about GMOs. They want us to be worried about 5G. I don't know. Sometimes they seem friendly. <laughs> but, yeah, so I know, like, again, I, where am I on time? Five minutes? Cool. All right, yeah, so I think I've said most of really what I wanted to say. You know, this, uh, I just will mention two things. So I'm going to be putting out a documentary on 5G at the end of this month. If you follow my channel, The Conscious Resistance, it's going to be a history of the FCC corruption, looking at the individual aspects of 5G and EMF in general. Because just a note, for those who are unaware, if you're totally blind on this area, I understand it was something I stayed away from for a long time. Because if you ever even suggest that cell phones are linked to cancer, you're called a conspiracy theorist. And I learned that early when I started to research this. I could see that. Well, guess what? About two weeks ago, the Chicago Tribune did an independent investigation specifically replicating the testing models from the FCC, and they tested iPhones and all kinds of other Samsungs. iPhone 7 particularly is emitting 200 times the legal limit of radiation at the FCC. And the other thing about that, those limits were made in 1996 with the Telecommunications Act, and there are studies that already show at those legal levels that there are still health problems. So you got health problems at the legal limit, this new Chicago Tribune shows the, sh the uh, iPhone 7 and others are 200 times past that. And that's probably what you got in your pocket right now. So the thing about it is 5G is not just 5G itself. We're learning more and more that, and this is, there was a really awesome article that came out from The Nation in 2018. It's called How Big Wireless Convinced Us That Cell Phones Are Safe. Uh, Project Censored called it the top uh, eight censored story of 2018. And they compared it to Big Tobacco. You know, that this is, there's trillions of dollars going to this to keep people from questioning the realities that we're surrounding ourselves with EMF devices all the time. You know, uh, e electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic radiation coming from all these devices all the time. And the 5G smart grid is only going to increase that because they're using millimeter waves. It travels very, very uh, small distances, so they have to install it. Some estimates, two to 500 feet. So you're talking every other, in Houston where they're putting it, there's already small cells right outside of middle schools. And so there's some neighborhoods that are actually starting to wake up to this. But like I said, I mean, it's, uh, the deal's already been done. You know, there's people I know who are literally physically trying to tear these things down now. How many of you are going to do that? How many of you actually feel, what's your, you know, where, what's your level of freedom versus, you know, your level of action? That's what you need to figure out. What are you willing to do to have this freedom? Find out what your goal of freedom looks like. Find out what that means to you. And it's going to be different for all of us. And that's okay as long as we're not infringing on each other's vision and we're not causing harm or violence. Find what that is. Start setting goals towards that. And how uncomfortable are you willing to make yourself to, uh, to attain that? Because it's going to involve more than just sitting on YouTube, sitting on Instagram, sitting on Facebook, sitting comfortably in our room. It's going to involve some level of action, both internal and physical. I'm going to leave you guys with a positive affirmation. First, just say thank you guys for your time. I appreciate everybody coming here, trying to learn something, do something that matters. So just repeat after me, if you will. We're going to do this one a couple times. This is brand new. We'll do this. But it's a tribute to Mr. John Trudell. So just repeat after me. We are power. 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 We have so much power within us. We're made of the earth. We're made of the soil. We're made of the heavens. We have everything within us to do this. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's going to take effort. It's going to take action. And it's not always going to be easy. And it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be long. And again, we might not see the end result of our work in this generation. But is there anything else more important than trying to make the world a better place and fix what's happened before us? I can't think of anything else. And I'm glad to be on this journey with you guys. Thank you so much.